Thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, one of the joys and one of the focuses of, of, of what I'm going to talk about is, is, is the joys of a rounded education. And one of the joys of working education is it's unpredictable. From day to day, you never quite know what's going to happen. I'll give you one example. I was teaching history to 11-year-olds, and we were teaching about Thomas a Becket and how Henry II was so irritated with his behaviour. He said to, said to the knights around him, who will rid, rid me of this meddlesome, pesky priest? And they went off to Canterbury Cathedral and murdered the prominent archbishop, which is not quite what Henry II uh, wanted. So a boy at the back put his hand up and he said, Sir, he said, um, he said, what's it called? What's the word that you use to describe the murder of a troublesome archbishop? And I could sense that I was being set up for a trap. So I used the old teacher's response of turning it round immediately. I said, OK, Josh, what, what do you think it might be called? He said, well, sir, he said, you kill somebody, that's homicide. He said, if you kill a race, that's genocide. I said, yes, so what do you think killing a pesky archbishop is? He said, pesticide, sir. <laughs> Always. So, so that gives you a sense, I think, of, of I, what most people who come into education, who teach, who lead schools, actually want to see in their schools. And I'm going to talk about, about league tables and also a little bit about tutoring, about tutoring, over-tutoring uh, young boys and girls to get into particularly academic schools, which is purportedly a, a particular issue in London and London education at the moment. And my concern about how that is producing a much narrower culture and mentality um, within education uh, at large. Uh, and it might seem odd that, that a school like St Paul's, which probably is close to the top of, of league tables, and I'm sure we do have parents tutoring their boys to try to get into our school. So it might be odd that I'm going to take a stance that is very much contrary uh, to that, uh, but I'll explain that, I hope, and try to articulate what I think education really should be about and how the focus on league tables and on tutoring is having a detrimental effect on our perceptions of what a proper, rounded, liberal education should be. League tables have proliferated since the middle of the 1990s where they were inaugurated essentially by journalists and they were adopted by the Department of Education and they seem now to be uh, a major um, objective measure of how a school is doing. And that's fine. Examination results are an important part of education and parents need to know that the quality of the academic education is producing appropriate academic outcomes and publishing those results, the results of each school in public examinations every year and actually comparing, seeing how schools do one to another is an entirely valid and worthy process. <laughs> as long as one doesn't pay too much attention to exact positions. I don't, that may surprise you. I never look at the league tables to see where St Paul's is. We should be in the top 20, not because we're a brilliant academic school, because we admit lots of bright boys, so we really should be somewhere in the top 20. Within that band, it doesn't really matter from year to year, and I would encourage you not to pay too much attention to precise positioning within league tables, because the same set of results can result in a different position year on year, in the, in the same year, depending upon the criteria that's used. Is it GCSE? Is it A, a star? Is it A level? Is it IB? How are you measuring your league table? So the same results can re result in very different positions in any given year. Um, they don't take into account remarks. It, even now, our boys took their exams in June, the results were published in August, we're still getting remarks in the middle of November. And, and those remarks might change your exam, it might go up two places, go down two places. It really doesn't matter beyond a broad sense of where a school is within a bigger band. 
There are significant shortcomings with league tables, which are well known. How can you measure a school's performance on just one single snapshot of a particular set of public exams in a particular year. It's a very narrow measure when a school's education is about much more than that. A school's academic education is about much more than uh, public examination results, uh, particularly just the, the grade outcomes. Uh, what is the school doing to stimulate a child beyond the assessed curriculum? That's an important element of an academic education that's not measured in league tables. Value-added performance. Some schools are absolutely superb at adding academic value, but their academic outcomes may be Bs and As and therefore they're not in the top tier of league tables, yet they're doing a superb job for the children in their care, and that's not reflected in league tables. In addition, um, all of the extracurricular activities are never measured in, in league tables. So they're very narrow and they shouldn't be the sole measure, objective measure, of what a school is like and how it's performing. Those within the profession know that an obsession with league tables also results in practices which benefit the institution but don't always benefit individual pupils. Some schools focus on the pupils at the CD borderline in order to enhance their league table position, to the detriment of the learning of other pupils during the same period. Um, there's talk, I don't know if it's true, but, but it's, it's a good polemic, um, there's talk of some schools pulling candidates who seem as though they're going to underperform in a subject and say, don't take that, take, take seven GCSEs rather than the 11 because we don't think you're going to perform particularly well in, in those subjects with the result that they protect the league table uh, position. We had a poorly candidate. We had one boy last year who was so poorly throughout the year that he could not attend school. And he's actually A star quality but he worked at home, we gave him lots and lots of information, and at the end of the year, he wanted to sit his A-levels from home without having had any teaching from us directly all year. He got a C, a B, and a B. He brought down our league table position, and we couldn't give a damn for the simple reason that we celebrated his performance more than anybody else's, because it represented a superb achievement in adversity. But by allowing him to sit the exam and be part of our statistics, we undermine our league table position, or would have done. Other schools cut the tail of weak candidates at GCSE. You must get A stars or Bs to go into the sixth form, and they recruit into the sixth form highest quality candidates, which enhances their league table uh, position. So there are a number of practices, subtly, that can be undertaken which um, are beneficial to the institution if they're focused upon league tables, but are not necessarily to the benefit of the individual child. If you're visiting schools, ask about these things. Do these practices go on? What is the school's attitude towards league tables and that institutional position and that perception of the institutional position through league tables, or do they actually focus more upon individual children? That leads me on to the subject of tutoring. Um, I, I read the newspapers, I even read one newspaper that said that, that a tiger mum had spent uh, thousands of pounds tutoring her son from the age of three to get into the school of which I'm head. I had no idea, and names had been changed to protect the innocent, so I still have no idea whether it's true or whom it might be. Tutoring, I think, puts unnecessary pressure on a child. It shouldn't be necessary if they follow the school curriculum and you encourage them to be interested and engaged in their studies at school at whatever age. That should be sufficient for the child to get in the, to a school that's right for them. If you're tutoring a child excessively in order to gain admission into a school, then the chances are they're going to struggle to keep up. So what's this about? Does it sound like a spiral that they're going to have to have tuition to keep up once they're in the school that they've been admitted to? If a child has been over-tutored and happens to get into a highly academic school as a consequence, it might not be the right school. 
they might not be happy there and it might be detrimental to them in the long run. It's much more important that they're at a school that suits their aptitude and suits the pace and level at which they learn and, and, and perform and progress. What on earth can schools do about tutoring uh, and this uh, move to excessive tutoring? Well, the first thing, we can discourage it. People like me can stand up a podia like this and say, actually, we're against it. And what amazes me is the number of heads in public and in private who say, it's ridiculous, it's a scourge, it's uneducational. And heads believe passionately that, the, that excessive tutoring is detrimental and inappropriate. Doing something about it is quite difficult. I'm not sure of the scale. So one thing that we're going to do at St Paul's is actually do anonymous surveys of pupils and parents next term to say, have you tutored to get in? Are you receiving additional tutoring to keep up at the school to get a sense of the scale of the problem? The other thing is to try and identify what is excessive tutoring. We all practice for exams. Everybody in this room has done exams and you, you, you practice and, and, and you get a little bit of extra help to practice how to, how to um, be examined and the techniques of, of, of examinations. So that's all right, but it's the extent to which there is um, sustained and significant support which pressurises the child and begins to create imbalance within their life, that they're not doing other things that children should be doing in order to get to a certain academic level. So we need to understand what we mean by excessive tutoring. Schools like mine can actually change their assessment criteria. How about that? In fact, we put a lot of emphasis on an interview where we ask questions that react to what the boy says to us so that we're not interested in the, in the precision and the knowledge base of the response. We're much more interested in the thought processes, the response to a novel question. We don't, we're not interested in the right answer. We're interested in how a boy responds to it. So interviewing is becoming much more important to us to try and break away from this sort of terror of over tutoring so that we can get to the core of, of a boy's intellectual uh, capability and potential. We're also talking to head teachers of feeder schools to get much more contextualised information in making our assessment on who to admit. How do they get on with other boys? How do they, how do they socialise? Education is primarily about socialisation. How do they get on with other boys? What's their attitude? Are they industrious? Are they reliable? Finding these qualitative um, criteria and characteristics to help us assess whether we think a boy is right for us. And good schools will contextualise test results and examination results in order to move away from the distortions that might be created by tutoring. And the final thing is to promote different values, and that's where I will finish up today, to say, actually, a world in which examination outcomes and testing is the primary measure of a school's academic achievement, or indeed that that prepares a child adequately for the world out there, is fundamentally flawed. Education is and always has been a balance between process and outcome. And I fear that the obsession with league tables and tutoring to test to get into schools means that that delicate balance has shifted. It's shifted too much towards outcome away from process. And that would therefore require people like me and people like you at dinner tables and so on to expose the values of, of a rounded liberal academic education. At the moment, the obsession with league tables and testing is putting huge amounts of pressure on boys and girls and also on the examination system. Examinations should be a milestone. They're moving and mutating into millstones upon children and upon the exam boards who are increasingly writing mechanistic and prescriptive uh, exam mark schemes because they're under pressure to get the exam marking accurate and right because so much rides upon it. And the result is that it used to be said teachers, teachers in some schools teach the test. Well, that happens some of the time at every school and so it should. 
but there's a real sense with, with tutoring and examinations now that we are teaching to the testing of the test and that the balance has actually shifted too far towards that obsession on outcome. An obsession with examination outcomes has broader issues for the employability and the adaptability of our young people in an increasingly complex, non-linear labour market. PwC, one of the top graduate schemes in the country, have recently abandoned the UCAS tariff as a major component of their assessment of who to admit on their schemes. They say it's about social mobility, fine, that's highly laudable. But at the same time, they say, actually, we're looking for other things that aren't tested by narrow examinations, particularly A-levels. We're seeking particular behaviours, we're seeking particular aptitude, certain skills, all of those soft skills of, of, of teamwork, collaboration, adaptability, the ability to apply knowledge in novel situations, to adapt to novelty, to apply acquired knowledge and skills to new situations. Tight examinations with really prescriptive um, mark schemes don't test that. In fact, they test that less and less. They test a mechanistic response. PWSC are basically saying the exam system isn't providing us with the information we need to assess those students who are going to be big players in the workplace in the future. And, and, and that should be a cause and a moment for reflection for all of us. So the plea is really a shift towards, um, back towards process from outcomes. Not to get rid of exams, there have to be milestones, there have to be photographs of, of, of progress and attainment and relative position has to be known, perfectly understandable, but a shift more towards um, process. And to me, process should focus on, on two things and just talk about these to finish off with. The first is scholarship and the second is opportunity. Scholarship can be measured in examination outcomes, of course it can, and which university you get into, it's part and parcel for sure. Scholarship is much more than that, it's, it's an attitude of mind, it's an approach. It requires intellectual inquisitiveness, academic curiosity, uh, enthusiasm, uh, integrity, discipline, industry and reliability. Nobody, however bright, ever fulfilled their intellectual potential without working damned hard for long periods of time. It's non-negotiable for um, academic fulfillment and indeed for scholarship. The ability to question received knowledge appropriately in a constructive and informed manner. Open-mindedness, responsiveness, um, respect for the views and ideas of, of others. All of these qualities should be promoted as part of scholarship. If we promote scholarship being beyond just examination outcomes, we will have people who are employable, but we'll also have young people who have judgment. Judgment in an increasingly complex and perplexing world. We will have young people who have consolation. Any situation, whichever any human being has finds themselves in, Somebody's been there before and written about it. The consolation to be found in a good book, in the ideas that have been garnered uh, and articulated over centuries, is a, a superb way for somebody to find peacefulness and resilience within their life and also inform how they cope with complexity and change uh, around them. Scholarship is broader than just examination outcomes. And we try to celebrate so they celebrated at St Paul's. We try to put these values into uh, action. For instance, we tell our teachers to teach way beyond the curriculum. Keep going beyond the curriculum. We need to see in schemes of work that you're teaching way beyond the curriculum. Why? Since when did Ofqual or any examination board write a, a, a curriculum and a specification for an exam that was sufficient to develop all of these qualities of scholarship that I've described in our brightest young people? They haven't. They don't. So teachers with great passion and subject knowledge need to expand horizons and inspire young people way beyond the examined uh, curriculum. A significant element in that. Um, 
I heard of a school that spent £50,000 getting trainers in to try and see if GCSE marking in the GCSE year could be improved to squeeze a few more uh, A grades out of the school's performance. Same year, we spent £75,000 on an electron microscope. The only school in the country to have an electron microscope, and we're training 13-year-olds how to use an electron microscope, and we use their work in our wider curriculum, all manner of different applications. When the National History Museum uh, does Fossils Week down at, um, at Lyme Regis, it doesn't have an electron microscope, which can show um, sort of composition of these fossils in ways that are just extraordinary and open up great possibilities. So we send our boys with an electron microscope to talk to young people about um, its potential and therefore to promote scholarship beyond the curriculum. The other thing that we emphasise very strongly is opportunity and roundedness. All schools will do this, all good schools will, will, will do this, but again, when you visit them, probe. What do they offer beyond just the academic curriculum and how committed are they to it? Is it just a sheen or is there real depth to what they offer? St Paul's, the general view is do something outside the classroom. And I try to articulate that, it's my job. Stand up, have visions, pick up litter, uh, and try to articulate uh, where the school is going. That's what all head teachers do. Our head boy stood up at the beginning of the year, this year, and I had no idea what he was gonna say to the whole school as, as they were a master. No idea whatsoever. He stood up and he said to all of the boys in the school, he didn't mention academic work, he said, I don't care and we don't care in the sixth form what you're interested in outside the classroom. We do care that you're interested in something and get involved. This is a fantastic opportunity. It's a privilege. Don't waste it. Get involved in something outside the classroom. And of course that promotes significant aspects of, of, of teamwork, collaboration and so on and so forth. So we have a huge range of different activities. We have 24 rugby teams at the weekend. So they do well at the top level, but if you just want a game, there's an opportunity there. One boy arrived four years ago and he said, there's not an improvisation society here. I said, what is an improvisation society? And they apparently, as you may know, it, it's, it's, it's a reactive comedy to, to, to an audience. So he set up an improvisation society. And at the end of the year, it had 400 people watching it. I was sitting on the stage, because they're asking me the questions, the brilliant improvised comedy. I know, because they didn't know what answers I would give. And I could see young boys looking up, the exemplification leading to emulation. They were looking up thinking, that's for me. I'm going to be doing that in four or five years' time. What gives me a greater kick from education? That. Not league tables. That is what really, really matters. And seeing a boy who'd arrived in the fourth form, nervous, slightly uncertain, intellectually diffident, through the confidence built by this imp sock, which I now know what it is, um, at the end of his year, being a leader within the school, superb exam results going off to Midwest University in the United States because it's the best university for improvisation society. So he's, he's going to do what, what he wants. And he has significantly touched the school and the lives of others on the way. And they're much more likely to be um, employable, uh, resilient and happy because of that combination of things. So, I'm over there. Almost there. Just got a, just got a nod. So I'll just finish off with, with, with one anecdote. When I arrived at St Paul's, they told me that speech day was called apposition. I had to look it up in the dictionary. Uh, and it goes back to the early 16th century. And what it is, is a first 16th century society's view of what an inspection of a school should be. And four boys stand up and they have to declaim for seven minutes each. And the quality of what they say judges whether the High Master continues in post next year. So if you understand it, this is a speech day where the head teacher doesn't speak. Now, how good is that? As soon as I heard that, I thought, I can do this. I, I, can, I can lead this school. And, and no, no, no betting on how long the head teacher is going to speak for, an hour and a half going through the results. 
My first apposition, four boys stood up, first one. James Aronson, on probability. For three minutes, he cracked jokes about probability. There are jokes about mathematics. For the last four minutes, nobody, parents, teachers, governors, boys, had the faintest idea what he was talking about. Next up, Joel Sanderson, a young musician of the year runner-up, um, National Youth Orchestra, talking on when is music sound, when is sound music, when is noise music, when is, is music noise. Um, third up, Ben Goldberg, uh, who had led Great Britain to uh, second place in the international debating championships. Is neoliberalism dead, or, or does it have a future? I'm sure he will be leading either the Labour or the Conservative Party, or indeed the Lib Dems in about 10 or 20 years' time as he went off to read PP uh, at, at Oxford. Debater, mathematician, uh, musician, well, these are just brilliant boys, aren't they? They're just that's, that's what a school like St Paul's does. It's just brilliance. Last one up. Not, not one of our brilliant boys, just an ordinary Pauline. When he'd arrived at school, he had no interest, but he got involved, and his metier, the thing that really got him going, was juggling. And he had become Middlesex under 21, 11 ball juggling champion in his five years at St Paul's. Fine. Apparently it's very difficult to juggle with more than 11 balls because of the physics. Seven minutes on the physics of juggling. He had a PowerPoint behind him. He talked to 600 people and he juggled whilst he was talking about the physics of juggling behind him. Brought the house down. Best speech we'd had at our position for years. And that, for me, exemplifies what a liberal, rounded education should be about. And I hope that I have articulated its importance and values to you, as well as exemplified it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for such a wide-ranging talk. Um, just before we open questions to the floor for 10 minutes, I just want to just pick you up on the tutoring aspect because I have a slightly more than a passing interest in, in that. Um, here's a problem, if I may say so. St Paul's is perceived by many parents, hundreds of parents we talk to every, every year, as being a highly selective academic school. In fact, you're perceived as being one of the most selective academic schools in the English-speaking world. You will not stop parents tutoring their children to get in your school. It's human nature. So, how about making your school less academically selective? Did John Collett want you to be so academically selective? Is it right to be so academically selective? And secondly, if you're a little bit more positive about tutoring, because you're an Oxbridge man, and you know that the, fu the fundamentals of the, the education system to which we all aspire is the Oxbridge tutorial system. If you're just a little bit more positive about it, do you think that you could keep tutoring overground rather than driving it underground? Yeah, uh, but, but both are very va valid points. John Collett, our founder, was actually committed to pre using education to prepare people for society, to contribute to the stock and well-being of humanity. That was his, his finding mission. Uh, and, and what we're doing is trying to, to, to reinvent that uh, and to redefine that for, for, for the modern era. We are extraordinary selective. The reason is that we can... We're able to be, but we deliberately say that what we do is provide an, a superb all-round education for very able boys. That's what we do, and that's what we're good at, that's what we're geared to, therefore that's why we look for highly able boys. The issue is how you assess highly able boys, and as, as I've indicated, we're looking at the ways in which um, we assess in order to try and broaden that and, and to cut through excessive tutoring. I was being a little polemical, of, of, of course, uh, in order to make, to make a point. Some preparation is entirely reasonable. It's, that's my point about the balance, how much. Uh, and of course, overground tutoring, much better than underground tutoring. Great, thank you very much. Let's have some uh, questions. I think this um, my question is that, what is the advantage and disadvantage between a single-sex school and all, you know, like a co-op 
And also, I have three girls. Is the St. Paul's Girls' School similar like St. Paul's Boys' School, just a different version or very different? Thank you. Thank you. Well, any question about any school is answered by not listening to what outsiders like me say about it, but actually going to the school yourself, watching, listening and asking good questions uh, and allowing your instincts to tell you what the school is like. So my sense is that St Paul's Girls School is very similar in, in, in its values. You'd need to go there to check. Uh, on, on single sex and separate sex, the arguments run both ways. I've worked in, in, in single sex and in, in co-ed uh, schools. Uh, it used to be a significant issue 10, 15 years ago when I started being a head teacher. People asked repeatedly that there, there are social disadvantages, if, even if there are academic advantages, to a single sex education. I'm hardly ever asked about that now because most of our uh, young people have such complex, busy uh, and lively social lives that they, they, they find social equilibrium in, in their relationships outside uh, the school rather than inside the school. So it, it all boils down to what's best for your three girls. And it might be a different answer for each of them, not necessarily uh, the same. And, and you can tease those arguments out by conversations with teachers at the various schools that you go around. Thank you. I think we have a question over here. Just briefly going back to the dreaded tutoring question, <laughs> do you think there is a uh, tutor-proof assessment process and if so, do you think any schools at all are practicing it? Um, no, is, is, of course not. Um, partly because um, tutoring knows different from, from a, a general education is, is, is preparing you to, to, to respond to, to certain questions and to certain sort of in, intellectual probing and, and, and challenges. Um, and so it's impossible to segregate tutoring from a stimulus from, from mum and dad and from friends and from teaching at the school. Um, so it's impossible to segregate it and it, therefore it's impossible to segregate it out or filter it out, better phrase, from the assessment process. Um, all we can do, as I suggested, is, is, is find out the extent. You know, there's a lot of chatter, that there's a lot of talk. I, I've, I've no idea how widespread the issue is and what it looks like. So let's try and find out more about it. Let's interrogate and then send out messages about we try to discourage this, we're looking for slightly different attributes. The emphasis on interviews we find is, is the best way to just try and lift some of the, the layers off the tutoring. And I think that's as much as, as, as one can do. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you. Um, I, get the, uh, I get the bit about league tables and scholarship. Um, many of the pupils that come to your school uh, are already at the top end of their current school. Um, how do you enable them to cope with such a high octane environment as your school psychologically okay uh, if you heard that how, how, how do highly academic schools uh, allow children or help children to cope with, with high octane um, my first response would be define high octane what, what, what does it mean how does it manifest itself how might it impact adversely upon y y young people um, so that, for instance, I, I, I asked the boys when, when, they, when I talked to them repeatedly, is this place competitive? Do you find it competitive? And the response is, is always yes. I said, right, why? What does it feel like and where do the pressures come? And their argument is actually there is no institutionalised competitiveness. We are never told by the institution, you must get A stars, you must win at this, you must do that. All we're encouraged to do institutionally is to do our best to get involved and fulfil our potential. They said the pressure, the competitiveness, comes from us and our parents. So, so if you want to change that, if that's how you define high octane, change our gene pool, change where we come from. 
because you, know, you, you can't segregate uh, home environment and, 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 and home aspirations, uh, which are often high from the pupils that, that, that we, 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 we recruit. Um, beyond that, high quality pastoral systems, um, you know, high levels of, of support for, for counselling, high levels of awareness for mental health issues and so on. A and any really good school will have a whole battery of, of pastoral uh, warnings, lights and, and support systems in place um, to help boys who, who, who need help uh, at a particular time if they're feeling uh, under excessive pressure, to help them manage their time, manage their home life, sometimes to manage their parents, sometimes to manage expectations. You know, the, the pressures upon them are uh, multivaried. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, if you've got a 10-year-old child who wants to become an actor when uh, grows up, should you, as a parent, put the kid on a performing arts school or an academic school? Um, that's a really good question. Um, it, it depends on the child and it depends on the school, and that's not a cop-out. It, it really does depend. It, you, you need to, to, to probe and, and, and question what might be best for your child. There are enough outstanding actors have gone through Oxford and Cambridge having had a traditional uh, high quality academic education. Rosamund Pike, Rachel Weiss, um, you know, uh, repeat to fade, but there are plenty of actors who've, who've done that route. Um, and my sense is that if in doubt, if all other things are equal, pursue a traditional academic education for as far as possible. Because then, if the acting doesn't work out, if, if, if high performance football doesn't work out, then you have an excellent broad base on which to fall back on and from which to um, develop a new career. So if, if in doubt, I would maintain a traditional academic uh, education for as long as possible. Thank you. Often I think students like to know how they're getting on. They like to not so much measure, but just have a sense of how they're developing. With the staff outside the classroom at St Paul's, how do you enable them to have a sense of how they are progressing overall as you know, the, their own personal development outside the classroom? It's a very good question. Um, we have just introduced self-reporting and, and, and self-assessment among pupils online system where they can keep a sort of inventory what they're involved in um, they can uh, set set goals um, for Im Im improvement or, or extension uh, and these are used as a basis of conversation with their with their tutors um, and they can use a range of, of qualitative and, and quantitative uh, measures to test how well they're doing. Are they moving up through the rugby teams? Are they moving up through the, through the grades in music? Are they involved in more specialist ensembles? Uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, getting the boys to, to, to believe in that system has, has not been entirely straightforward, but, but, but it's, it's beginning to work extremely well. And so it does, it does identify and celebrate those difficult to measure things that, that, that can't be measured in league tables, but as I've said, are important. Therefore, you ought to make some attempt to, to measure and track them. Thank you. One, one last question, I'm afraid, then we're going to have to wrap this up. Thank you. Um, do you foresee a time, perhaps, where, for example, at a school such as yours, um, you would do away with the 11 plus entrance and rely perhaps on the um, references of the previous prep or primary school as well as your interview process um, and taste today's. Yeah, um, we, 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 we do at, at St Paul's um, in, implement something not too dissimilar from, from that. We, we have an online test sat in each boys' own school, so in the comfort of their own home environment, as it were, 
in order to get a, quite frankly, a, a ridiculous number of applicants down to a manageable level. So we use that as a filter. There's no way we can avoid that. And then we interview uh, something like 300 boys. So we interview 300 and take up references and have a constant dialogue with the school in order to evaluate both those contextual um, attributes and characteristics that I was talking about and also progress, how they're doing uh, uh, over the period. Uh, and we use that to inform the interview. And the interview is the key to deciding whether we admit or make an offer or not. Then they have to do a tick box, which is to get through the common entrance. But essentially, if we've offered, we're pretty certain this boy is right for us. And that is primarily on the interview and on the school's reference point.